Welcome to the Tiger Interview Series. In this episode, we have Brett McQueen of Lightning Performance Solutions. He is an athletic trainer that specializes in injury risk assessment, movement corrections, rehabilitation, and evaluation for recreational, amateur, professional, and tactical athletes. This is a special episode for me because he is one of my good friends. He actually trained me when I was playing at Missouri State. He is an unbelievable wealth of knowledge. He's continually always learning and trying to figure out new ways to make his athletes better. I had fun with this one. You guys are going to enjoy this conversation, especially with the summer season ahead of us and injuries being a big factor in that as we start breaking down our bodies. So we talk about nutrition, we talk about athlete health, um, and then we also talk a little bit about the mental side as well. So enjoy this episode. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Tiger Interview Series. I'm your host, Spiker Helms, and today we have Brett McQueen um, from Lightning Performance. Um, I am super excited about this because me and Brett are good friends, um, and he actually helped train me as well, um, kept me on the field longer um, and I probably would have had some more injuries if it wasn't for him. So I'm a huge advocate of his profession and you might be thinking, Oh, is this about strength training? Is this about rehab? It's literally all of the above. And, um, we both went to Missouri state and that's how I got, um, hooked in with the training realm and just totally believe in it. Um, 100%. I actually would spend a lot of my days during the week when I had off time, um, going into the trainer's room and you would think like from a player's perspective, Oh, you're trying to avoid that room at all costs. Um, I was actually the complete opposite. And I think I was one of the few athletes at Missouri state that lived in that training room, um, consistently. And you're starting to see more players, um, like LeBron James, he's more into the training room. Tom Brady was in more in the training room. So without further ado, I want to introduce Brett. Um, and then we're going to jump into some really cool rabbit holes. Um, and as Brett likes to call them space jam rabbit holes, um, that I think everyone's going to find interesting. So Brett, kick it off. Give us uh, more background on who you are, um, and how you've gotten to this point. I have gotten to this point, um, by a lot of people uh, believing in me, uh, even when I didn't sometimes. And uh, that's part of what makes the story cool. So Brett McQueen, um, I own and run Lightning Performance Solutions here in Kansas City. Um, I'll go through all the social media stuff later because um, I do have all that. Um, I, like Spiker said, I did my undergraduate work at Missouri State and Different universities um, teach different ways, um, all to prepare you for, for the boards for athletic training, but Missouri State took a much different approach on the rehab and injury prevention side of things um, that has now morphed into a much bigger um, program that uh, – there more and more of those athletes are spending more time in the athletic training room from a preventative side of things. Um, the, the traditional medical model has always been very reactionary um, in that you have a problem. Now let's fix it. Would it be nice if you just prevented the problem on the front end so that you didn't have to miss all the downtime and um, you know, to your credit, you were one of the first ones to, really be in the athletic training room working on things taking a deeper dive into your body and overall wellness um when in a lot of respects you didn't need to um or at least at the time we didn't think you needed to um but you were always just constantly in there working on the different things and that's probably what kept you going as long as it did um now that uh you know oh, oh, 10, 11, 12 years later. Um, I, know. I, know. I know. It's been crazy. <laughs> Gosh. Um, yeah. Ignore the grade. Well, well it's, it's, 
It's funny because I was thinking about this because I knew that our interview was coming up and I was doing some um, prehab stuff before my workout. I still do um, some of the stuff is still stick, but I was kind of doing like a body check on how does my body feel kind of like when I did when I was with you guys. I was like, holy cow, my body just feels like crap right now. And I and and, and like my wife says, like, no, you're you're still in shape and everything like that. But it's just the athletic side. It got I got so fine tuned to a point where any ache I knew that, oh, I can fix it this way and I'll be literally feeling like 100 percent every single day it wasn't like i was dealing with a soreness in game 20 or game 25 which is so hard to communicate to players about that feeling and how it felt it's so hard to like convince them like dude the weight room's nice but the training room is like way better it's like the holy land of being able to go out there every single day and feel like hey i can i can let it loose on this throw and not having to draw back it back a little, a little bit absolutely um and, and i think that there there's always a fine balance there um you know part of it's nice that we're in in march now and march is national athletic training month um i didn't decide that uh but whatever uh it is and, and I think the more and more kids I see in, in my clinic here, the more I hear how, I don't want to say bad, but lower quality the care that they're getting from some of the high school and club athletic trainers is, um, which is disheartening. And I don't want that to be a discouragement um, uh, for going in there to get the therapy and and help and training and prehab and all those things that you need. But I would just use as an encouragement of if you don't feel like you're getting what you need, then go find it. Um, Because there's always somebody out there who knows what you need to do from therapy, rehab, injury prevention, prehab, whatever perspective. who has a medical background and training that you can go lean into. Um, That is sometimes uh, you can get good information from coaches uh, or you can get the situation. Like I saw a new guy yesterday, senior in high school, had a partial tear of his Tommy John in the fall and no physical therapy or rehab was prescribed and his juco coach was just kind of managing that uh which is not appropriate on any level um Mm -hmm. so those situations still exist out there but there are plenty of us that have a pretty good idea of what you need to do um and so don't ever hesitate to reach out and, and seek some other advice if you don't feel like you're getting what you need with your high school athletic trainer or club athletic trainer. Well, I think it's probably an issue too, is that players don't know what they need before they actually need it. I think that's probably one of the main, main drivers. And I, I give the credit to um, you guys at Missouri state, Jim, you Mitch, and being able to literally convince, uh, convince me that, Hey, there is another way here um, and luckily, I think it, this sounds so messed up. Luckily, I hurt my hamstring my junior year, and I was like, "What is this? How, I've never had an injury, and now I have an injury." And being able to realize, "Oh, I'm getting at that age where I actually need to work on this stuff," and my strength actually improved more dramatically than it would have been if I just literally just pounded weights in the weight room and just re- literally grunted it out and try to get every gain I possibly could. Um, but really realizing like, Oh, I got to make sure my body works efficiently, but first then I can actually stack on those pounds. Absolutely. Why do you think that, um, players are bad at staying healthy in a season? That is, that's the age old question and a space jam size rabbit hole. Um, it's such a multifaceted problem. 
We have athletes that use all kinds of different um, substances out there that um, range from pre-workouts to the creatines to different proteins. Um, a lot of that industry is so unregulated, even though it says there's something or not something in the in the container, there is no guarantee on what you're putting in your body. Um, so I think that there's a lot of that that playing havoc on the system that you just don't know about. There's the age old sleep problem and teenagers especially would rather stay up playing video games or chatting with um, a significant other than they would getting good rest and good sleep. Um, there's the pressures at school. There's um, loss of sleep due to anxiety and rehashing all of the um, things that they did. Um, you know, nobody ever goes back and looks at a game and says, wow, I did really, really great today at, at all these things. Uh, everybody remembers the bad stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's a point where you rehash the bad stuff and, and learn from it and work on improving, but letting it bother you and losing sleep at night, that's, that's a big problem. Um, because sleep is the number one best recovery tool that, that there is. Um, and I think actually um, Eric Cressy had a big thing on that um, maybe a couple months ago that um, the best performance enhancement drug we have is sleep. Um, so really getting good quality sleep in. Um, late night bus rides with early morning school, and that's obviously spring season. Um, the tournament ball in the summer, you might finish a game at 11 o'clock at night and turn around and have to play at 8 or 9 in the morning, and that's just the turnaround times on some of those is, is just a little bit ridiculous. Um, to ask so then, to, how do you how do you combat that though? Like, how do you combat the turnaround times? And like, luckily, the high school players aren't doing those twelve-hour bus trips that some of the college teams are. Um, I mean, I just remember like, oh, it was awesome going to um, Louisiana, but I was really dreading the next week because of I knew that I wasn't going to get in skill work. It was mostly just going to be prehab stuff. And then I was just surviving at practice to get like the skill stuff in. Um, how do you, how do you, what would you recommend for a player to actually fix that? Like being able to do that. We finish a game at 10 PM and then we have a quick turnaround time at 10 AM. Figure out what the lowest hanging fruit is. Um, is your skill going to drastically change by getting that extra skill work in before the next game? No. Is your body going to be able to turn around if you go do um, the same amount of intensive warm up and workout beforehand, or if you have an extensive cool down routine? All those things are important, but you have to figure out where, where the low hanging fruit for you as an athlete is. And a lot of times that's, yeah. So you sleep in a little bit longer and don't necessarily take every single skill rep that you normally would warm your body up, um, get everything loose, do the prehabby things that you need to, to wake everything up and then go for it. Um, I think that so you'd you almost recommend like, You'd almost recommend that a coach says like, okay, we finished the game. We won the game. Everyone's celebrating. And then we have that quick turnaround time. There's no, we're not doing BP the next day. We're not, we're show, we're showing going. We're literally, we're going to show up 30 minutes before game time and get our bodies loose and call it good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That simple. That simple. Which goes against every, which goes against everything that any coach thinks. <laughs> but at, at, at that at that point, how many hacks have you taken by that point in the season? It's true. How many ground balls you've taken at that point? Yeah. Are are you so like when, when does when does BP make sense and when does not BP make sense? I, I think it makes sense if if 
you're if that's your first day on the field and you you're not used to playing on that field okay take it see how the field plays that's a great opportunity just to get a, a game scenario play feeling um how does the ball come off the dirt how does it come off the, is it turf does uh you know where where's the wind coming from what's the sun angle going to be at these different points in the day um just based on the field layout um how much room do i have from third to the to the fence or first to the fence you know feel those things out but pass once you get a good feel for the play we go through it especially on like a college series you go through it then again on saturday and sunday the same routine nothing's changed about the field all you're doing is taking more and more and more hacks um or taking more and more reps that's not necessarily a bad thing but does it need to be as extensive as it um normally is i don't think so so it's almost like having like a hybrid model so like you have was one of your models is like okay we're gonna do a full bp we're gonna do this 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 and this our hybrid model is like you're taking one round and one round only and that's it you're just getting your eyesight locked in and then we're we're rolling absolutely that's a very interesting concept because like not not many coaches want to do that because they want to stick with their routine they're not really thinking about the body. They're thinking about like, okay, we just got to stick with our routine and we're going to win ball games rather than like game 30, every dude out there is just completely exhausted and they don't know why they're exhausted. Cause I mean, an athlete, you have to be very self-aware as an athlete to really know that like very self-aware. Cause I, I mean, I haven't really understood my body until like now like really, really understood it. Like, oh, this is what makes sense, which would make sense because like LeBron James has talked about that where I do, if I do this, I do, I get this. If I do this move, I feel this way where probably when he was like 18 years old, he's like, oh, just give me the ball. I'm going to go dunk it. Absolutely. Um, And and I think that there's a time and a place for everything, but especially the further you get into the season and that, long season grind is just you know, you've got four or five eight games in a week why why are you doing the extra stuff it's not warming you up it's wearing you down so then i guess that leads us into this question is like what's what is the most frequent injury that you're going to see if you just keep playing that same routine out i, I guess from a baseball perspective and softball perspective what, what do you see break down first for athletes is it their arms is it their hip flexors is it well so i i think arm injuries are always a product of something else um when the the physics finds the path of least resistance and the force just blows out somewhere um most i would I would say all um, UCL injuries and shoulder labrum injuries outside of a collision um, are overstress injuries. I won't even say overuse injuries because you've got, you know, you can't tell me that the guys like Nolan Ryan who, who would throw and 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 never really had a problem you can't tell me that the body isn't designed to use something a lot. And maybe they're just freaks, who knows, but it's weird. We see some people who throw in a ton and they never have a problem. And we have some that throw very little and all of a sudden there's a problem. So I think it becomes an overstress problem and it's an over physics problem. Um, A lot of times it's in the landing mechanics and far too often everybody's concerned about arm care and that's probably the most annoying question i get is what do i do for arm care nothing for your arm um or almost nothing for your arm focus on the core stability and um leg power stability deceleration all that um if we look at the ankles and hip flat and hips and say, okay, these are your power producers um, and your landing mechanism. Well, there's not much point in driving your car down the road with the shock absorbers welded stiff. So why wouldn't you work on 
the shock absorption and, and landing mechanics for throwing. Um, it's typically where the shoulder and elbow blow up. Is so right at that almost fit, release so point, and uh, the physics goes out through the weakest point. So you're saying the inefficiencies are going to be in your core and your legs. So if your core and your legs are pretty much no good, you're more than likely going to have some type of injury that's going to show up. Absolutely. So like you're telling a lot of athletes to get six packs? No, absolutely not. Avoid them. <laughs> Avoid six packs? Avoid six packs of all kinds. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it, it doesn't help you. Um, so, so explain, explain that because pro probably someone on the other line, I'm, I'm thinking in my head right now, it's like, why, but that means that you have a strong core, right? If you have a six pack of abs. Oh no, no. The abs are only one part of the core. Let me grab my, um, I've had this same can of Coca-Cola here, um, for, well, I don't know, it expired in 2017. Um, never been opened whatever all right so if you think of the core like a can the top of the can is the diaphragm the bottom is the pelvic floor and everything around are the walls if we think about the six pack that's essentially just that nutrition label okay that just tells us how well you eat how um how hard you train the abs all that stuff but it really doesn't keep the contents stable um, of the can. So this unopened can, if I were to ask you to step on it and stand on it, would it hold your weight? Absolutely. There's so much pressure in here that you could stand on it and it would hold you up. But if I pop that top just a little bit to where we just barely hear a little sizzle, um, and don't even like can't pour liquid out of it, but there's a little bit of air released. Um, as soon as you stand on that, it's going to crush. The core is the same way. The whole thing matters. Um, and when we start looking at um, glute drive inefficiency um, in, in athletes and, and poor lat engagement, um, the lats and glutes couple very well on the posterior side from a power production and deceleration perspective. Um, the neurologic principle of autogenic inhibition i hope everybody's paying attention there's a quiz like that that's that is a really large word brett autogenic inhibition <laughs> tells us that if one side's turned on the other side can't turn on it's very simple so if the front side like the abs and hip flexors are super 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 turned on then what's opposite of that that can't turn on very efficiently the Your glutes lats. and lats yeah, yeah. And those are the big decelerators and power producers um, for all. Because your lat runs all the way down to your near to your um, hip, and then runs all the way up to your shoulder the blade. Glute through the thoracolumbar fascia. Yeah, they're all connected. So an athlete, to kind of put it in simple terms, the athlete just needs to worry, like really worry about in the training is their hip flexors, which is just right above the quad, correct? Mm -hmm. and, and then your, your body butt, those off. Turning those off. You don't want those on. Nope. So you want to, you want to, you, but you don't want to train them. Okay. So you're Head training lifts and butterfly kicks and all that core work. All that yeah. is, is, is irritating the hip flexors, which is going to inhibit the glutes. Cause you want your glute to fire. Big time. Your glutes are your greatest asset. So back squats, are you, are you doing some, um, are we, are we doing all back squats? Are we doing front squats? What are we doing? There's, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Um, at the end of the day, I, in, in the training that I do with people, I have moved away from spending a lot of time in the sagittal plane, which is all that squatting movement. Um, and the frontal plane, which is more like the side to side movement. And I train everything in the transverse plane. Rowing is a transverse plane activity. Hitting is a transverse plane activity. Running is a transverse plane activity. Yet 90% of our weight room training is all sagittal plane and frontal plane. Um, so you have to do, you have to have, you have to be creative to mimic those moves. 
Absolutely. And, and really train more single leg, single arm and offset the load side to side. So we doing, we're doing jumps. We're doing, we're doing pistol squats. Some of it. Yeah. Pistol squats are, are great. Um, airborne lunges are great. Um, I love a Bulgarian split squat. Um, Copenhagen planks. There's all sorts of different things there that are. So would you label get ups? Would you label Turkish get ups under that category as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't do the full Turkish get up with a lot of people anymore. Um, but I, I use a lot of different components of it. Um, uh, half kneeling windmills, um, which is kind of the midpoint of the Turkish getup. I think there's a lot of merit to that. Um, there, um, anything arm bar where you're getting a dissociation of the lower half and the upper instability of the upper half. Um, I like to use the TRX rib trainer a lot. Um, Mm-hmm. Just to pull so that then how do we road reload? So then the, the, this just popped into my head. So then how do we turn off those hip flexors from firing too much during our workouts? Because again, we don't want to overtrain those hip flexors. That is the, is the age old question. <laughs> the age old question. Um, there are, there are a lot of ways. There's a lot of manual therapy ways that can be done. Um, I know a lot of people have the massage guns out there. They can be helpful. Um, the biggest thing with those massage guns is everybody wants to crank it up on the highest setting because it feels really good. Mm-hmm. All that does, the higher the setting, the more it turns up your nervous system. So if we're trying to get the muscle to relax, we don't want to turn it up. We want to turn it down. So using those on the lowest settings is incredibly helpful. Um, getting some hard pressure in there. Um, like sometimes I'll have people like lay on a kettlebell handle and, um, flex and extend their knee, um, with the kettlebell kind of in their lower gut that helps kind of massage that, uh, hip flexor out the best way, um, that I do it is with dry needling, um, which you have to go to somebody who knows what they're doing for that. Um, I, every throwing athlete I have, uh, that comes in here pretty much regardless of what their complaint is, is going to get the anterior hip needled so that we can calm everything down and really kick on the back. And I'm kind of thinking this through from a high school athlete standpoint, because there's going to be a lot of guys traveling this summer and I know sitting in a car is going to more than likely tighten those puppies up what what's your recommendation sitting, like the first... car, sitting in school sitting in the video game chair sitting 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 is your um worst enemy on the hip flexors um there are so like we were talking about before we started recording it, it's snowing here in kansas city right now out front there's a street and I ask people all the time, if, uh, if there was eight inches of snow on that street, it's a mile long, um, could you go out and shovel it? Well, yeah, you could. It might take you two weeks, but you could do it. I would rather use a snowplow. The snowplow gets the snow gone, and it's just, it's just done. Um, dry needling is kind of that, uh, that snowplow effect. It turns off the hip flexors, opens up that deep hip internal rotation mobility, and then there are a bunch of drills that I give people to maintain that. And as long as people are good about maintaining that, it doesn't really matter how much you sit um, and all that. As long as the timing for resetting everything is, is used appropriately, um, you can reset those things really easy through a lot of the drills. Okay. So but would, they, would you recommend like a roller? Would they roll, roll, roll it all out? if they don't have dry needling? Yeah, I mean, again, like a roller would be a snow shovel. Lacrosse ball, kettlebell, any of those things are gonna be a snow Snow shovel or snow blower. Um, The only true snow plow that I've found at this point is the dry needling. Um, And it it is what it is. As soon as I find something else that's equal to it, then I'll gladly start recommending it. Um, I just haven't found anything as effective yet. 
So I'm guessing you'd recommend them having people in their corner that have this knowledge like you do. I think that's probably number one. So then who would be the second person in your, in their corner throughout the year? Would it be a nutritionist? Would it be a strength trainer? How, how do you view that from in season work? Obviously they have their coaching staff, but I'm just so big on trying to figure out your inner circle. Um, and with Missouri state, it was, it was pretty simple. It was laid out for us and you guys have a really good program. So it's like, what, who, who should these high school athletes go to during in season? I would argue that your, so Yogi Berra said it best. Baseball was 90% mental. The other half is physical. Um, and, and I would argue that for all sports, um, but baseball tends to be especially high on the, uh, headspace stuff. Um, get somebody in your corner who you can do a mental dump with, whether that is a professional counselor, um, a mentor, a friend, um, teammate, coach, whoever, like there, there's a lot of different people that that looks like. Um, and obviously if it's getting to a, a dangerous mental health standpoint with it, or your performance is really tanking because of that, then get in to see a mental health professional. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, you're stronger by doing that than, than you are by not doing it. Um, I would argue that after the, 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 prehab, rehab, keep the body healthy and going person, right here. Um, you have to address the mind. Um, from a nutrition standpoint and load management standpoint, that athletic trainer should be able to be a big advocate for you. Um, and, and being able to manage a lot of those things, different uh, dietitians who specialize in sports um, would also be, uh, very helpful. Um, you know, something I, I, I'm not a dietitian by any stretch of imagination, but I do calculate macro and micronutrients, uh, for my patients and help get them on a better, um, fuel intake plan, being able to calculate what the needs are, um, calories in versus calories out, uh, helping make better choices for what a good calorie looks like, um, versus a crap calorie and, um, all those things. So really just finding somebody who specializes in a lot of that stuff is, is really helpful or a couple different people. How would you label the difference between in season and off season training? Um, kind of where I'm going with this is that everyone wants to make gains during the off season, obviously. But then they have athletes have this idea of, oh, I can still get gains during the season. Can you kind of go into the differences and why that's not necessarily a true thing to think? Like it's it's more of a myth than anything else. Absolutely. It's a myth. Um, And so let me break that down even further. You have the preseason in season postseason and off season. Okay. So it's, it's really even a lot more than just the in season, off season stuff. Um, the, I think the biggest one that people miss out on is the postseason stuff. And postseason is, um, I would argue the most important one for, body prep and games um after the season everybody wants to go right into the off-season training and start fixing all the things that they didn't do well or get the big gains and all that stuff we talked you know 20 minutes ago about the in-season fatigue and mitigating load and how many reps you're taking all that stuff well if you finish the season on a saturday and you want to start the next week or even the week after on your off season training, your body hasn't recovered. That's where you get in to see somebody, um, get in somebody like my clinic, um, another rehab clinic, see chiropractor, whoever, whoever it is in your circle, 
go see them, get your body tuned up, just get everything adjusted back in line. Everything's happy. Um, talk about what the off season, um, nutritional stuff looks like versus the in season because the caloric needs are going to be different. Make sure that you get back on a really good sleeping schedule because you're likely, especially at the very end of the season with the championship tournaments and everything, it's just, it's a grind to get through those tournaments alone and everything's a little out of whack. Give yourself a month or two just to decompress and let your body rest and heal. Then you start into the off season training where you can make all the gains and I caution people on having more than three specific things that they want to fix. Um, because your, your body, especially, you know, during the adolescent years, um, going through puberty, your body just can't handle more than three big type of overarching goals. Um, when we're talking about, um, bat uh, exit velocity, uh, throwing velocity, all those things. You, you can't, you can't increase your vertical a foot, um, increase your squat max by 150 pounds, increase your bat speed velocity, 10 miles per hour, your throwing velocity, 12 miles per hour. You can't, you can't do all of those things. Focus in on one to three and chances are a lot of the others will follow as well. Um, so have your overarching goals one to three, and then, um, kind of subset areas that you would like to see improvement, but if it doesn't, okay, cool. Then we work on that the next time that's your off season training. And then there should be a period between off season training and preseason training, where again, you get everything adjusted, uh, make sure the body's in good shape right before you go into that preseason. The preseason is the fine tuning of those skills, making sure that your ball handling is good, making sure that your hand eye stuff for the hitting is good. Um, focusing on those minor tweaks with the swing. You could spend a year tweaking little components of your swing and do nothing but tweak little components of your swing and not make it any better or any more accurate. Um, Really, that the preseason time is where you fine tune it. Get those tactile skills of baseball back. Um, you don't need to spend a ton of time doing that in the in the fall uh, or the off season. It just it, it doesn't it doesn't translate very well to the in season stuff. Um, the other big strength uh, and, and agility power skills do. So um, transition that preseason right into the end season. Now we're at a load management standpoint and really you're not trying to make any gains. Um, that's where you focus more on the numbers and trying to dig into the game of baseball in season and get better at that. Too many times I had a question uh, earlier this week. Hey, how many times uh, a week can I lift? Okay, well, you're in season for high school ball, and then we're going to go right into club season. Well, I would say that no more than four workouts a week. Okay, so I'm going to go to my lifting club four days a week. I'm like, well, how many days a week do you lift in school? Well, two or three. Okay, so those count as well. Um, a lot of times I see these kids that are lifting five days a week on their own, three to five days a week in school. So now we're at 10 workouts a week, practice every day. So now we're at 15 practices and then maybe a couple games or scrimmages early on. It just, it's too much. You'll wear out before you get three weeks into season. Your body's just going to be completely toasted at that point, and you're not recovering well. Because I mean, in season, your 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 main goal is to try to one maintain your maintain your strength, but two make sure that your body is running efficiently. Because what really matters is the game. <laughs> Sometimes we lose aspect of that as a as a player. Is that like oh, we think if we just work out, the games will kind of fall in line, um, but 
it's more of your you have to view it as kind of like a football player football player has that they play once a week they recover on saturday and sunday um they'll do they'll do some light lifting some light work and then they'll be back onto the field and then they might put in one more workout after that and then that's about it yep and the the percentages of those workouts are relatively low um off seasons where you're getting up in that 85 90 percent of one rep max uh, mm-hmm. in season you're, 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 doing, you're doing light reps you're doing you're not doing light reps you're doing you're doing lightweight large reps, making sure that your body's moving efficiently. Yep. We, we talked a briefly on it, like with the, with the in season, but how would you structure out a high school player? If, you, if, if someone came to you and be like, Brett, I'm going to give you all reins here. You have my eight week, eight weeks. And I, I need you to give me a solid structure for the eight week travel season. Um, I travel four times and I play four times at home. How would I how would I set myself up? The, there's probably fifty more variables that I that I need. <laughs> um, so uh, this, uh, this is why our conversations go so long because I just want a simple answer, and then you always give me those fifty variables, which is right. It's true. It's true. There there is no simple answer, and that's that's yeah, where yeah. people run into the problems is they want the simple answer, um, and and trust me, I. I wish I could give you just a simple answer. Um, and if there was a simple answer, I'd probably be a millionaire right now selling it to people. Um, but the, the simple answer is it depends. Um, if you are, you have to take into consideration um, number of practices, number of games, um, sleep schedule, uh, lifting schedule. So like one of the big things in season with uh, high school kids, um, particularly during the high school season, is we can't mess with their days of weights at school. Got to participate. Got to get the grade, right? So um, and, and a lot of times those weights programs are run by football coaches that if it's not Football, it doesn't exist in the world. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I love football and, and football players and football coaches, but um, it, it's not real conducive for a lot of uh, the baseball kids. Um, so if you've got a schedule where you're lifting five days a week, you don't need to be doing anything extra. Um, go to practice, go to your games. You don't need extra training. If you're on a block schedule where, you know, one week lift twice, one week you lift three times, then picking up an extra one in there to really hone in on some of the rotary stability stuff, it's totally appropriate. Um, and, and that can be more of a, uh, almost a skill driving workout, um, where you're working on resisting that rotation, um, Palov presses, uh, again, TRX stuff, uh, even a TRX resistance band where um, you're doing more of the body weight stuff, but you can rotate on it. Um, mm-hmm. All that stuff is going to be very helpful for maintaining the mobility, um, maintaining the stability, and, and driving that rotary, um, rotary control. But again, it, it just depends. Uh, as far as like, if you're looking at, at the summer, um, are you a summer ball, uh, player that wants to, that also plays football? Do you have to go to football weights as well? Uh, are you at practicing games on, uh, on evenings all week? And then you've got, uh, football workouts at 6 a.m. Or then do you have your basketball team over the summer where they're allowed 20 to 40 hours of training? I get kids that, that, that do football workouts, basketball or wrestling workouts, play baseball and work a job. And guess when they always get hurt? Mid season. Middle of July. Like probably, probably in that last three, three to four weeks, right? Maybe that last like stretch. Pretty much uh, last year, I told four or five kids and families like, okay, well, you're going to get injured between July 8th and July 22nd. And they're like, 
what? No, you can't. Yep, they did. You put that curse on us. No, I didn't. I just know how your body's going to break down over time and you're not doing anything about it um, other than just doing all the things. So um, it's almost like you're a ticking time bomb. You don't realize you're a ticking time bomb. Yep. I, and I'm a huge proponent of being a multi-sport athlete. But when you're in season for one, you need to be in season for one. Yeah, but then there's the, then people are going to – I can already hear it in my head. Like, well, I had, socially I can't do that because I have to be there if I want to play. And I totally get that. Yeah, but then I always think to myself, I was like, yeah, but if you're good enough, that coach is going to play you no matter what. He's not going to be a dummy. Right. Absolutely. Um, well, to an extent. Um, <laughs> uh, not, not to dog on coaches, but I have – Seen that go the opposite way a lot of times. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, managing that schedule, you can't be up out late. Um, what's like? What's like some key tips? Like that's. I guess that's where I really want to go with this. Is like, what are what are like a good few t- key tips that they can literally plug in their head and keep on thinking about as they go through their season. Recovery, recovery, recovery. Anything you can do to recover is your best bet. Uh, so, so sleep is like you got to get it. You have to at least get eight hours, nine hours of sleep. Like a hundred percent. Like if you're under that, you're pretty much going to be a ticking time bomb. It's not negotiable. Um, and then nutrition, making sure that you're getting ample t- ample amount of food in in the system what every two hours every three hours depends on depends on the person but yeah that's a pretty good rule um and uh this is going to step on a lot of toes but put down the phone um the amount of brain energy that uh the screen time sucks from your brain um is showing a lot of decrease in performance and um there's been a stark increase in injuries since the second generation iphone came out wow no way Mm -hmm. um so so there's a direct correlate so there's a direct correlation with injuries and the second gen iphone well, yeah. and iPhone say is it iPhone is it iPhone sales? Like like is there's a direct correlation with the iPhone sales? I think it's that um the second gen iPhone came out um you know what about a, less than a year after the first generation and the first generation was so expensive and new that mm-hmm. some people got it some people didn't and that's the second gen third gen is when the sales really ramped up and so more people exposed to it um and then injury rates went up at that time yep and injury rates are going up there there's a couple of uh studies that have looked at recently um especially on the youth injury side things the like eight to 12 year olds um one of the study or one of the questions they asked was do you have a phone and the injury rates of kids that do have a phone versus those that don't have a phone are higher. Wow. Um, wow. And the severity of injuries is is higher. So um, that goes into concussion that goes into musculoskeletal injuries, all of it. Um, It would kind of, it would make sense. It would make sense though, because the phone could prohibit you from sleeping that could be a major factor. Um, the screen time, I guess, uh, I, I don't, I don't know that answer, but I'm, I'm guessing. I would love to know is like the CS study that has screen time correlated with injury rates versus fo- iPhone sales and injury rates. Like just kind of like breaking it down to see where, where's the real factor in all of it. I mean, that's very interesting. And, and I don't think it's necessarily an iPhone problem. I think it's a smartphone problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and the internet in general. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, we won't even go down that rabbit hole. Um, the uh, One of the big 
factors is when you look at the different light spectrums that um, we can see, visible light spectrums, uh, blue light tends to be a really noxious stimulant for the brain, um, which is why you saw a couple years ago the, the blue light blockers uh, become really popular. And mm -hmm. there is, and I'm, I've been an avid iPhone guy for a long time, um, so I don't know what the settings on anything else are, but you have the night shift mode on um, the iPhone. And I, I tell every single one of mine, uh, one of my kids that I, that I train and work with, like that thing goes on at 7 p.m. Two to three hours before you go to bed at a minimum. Wait, it may it makes sense because um, ring or the aura ring and whoop straps um, have that have that um, that percentage breakdown and making sure that you close that close all that stuff down um, one to two to three hours before bedtime. Absolutely, because uh, it's going to affect your REM sleep and your deep sleep, right? Yep. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Brett, I want to. I want to leave it off there. I know there's going to be more questions that are going to be popping up into my head as we end this. And I'm, I want to bring you back on again, obviously. Um, but um, how can people reach you? Um, go ahead and plug in your social profiles, um, email address, best way to contact you. Yeah. So info at lightning performance KC is a great email address to get a hold of me um, on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, I am at Lightning Performance KC. Um, particularly on, on my TikTok channel, I have a ton of different corrective exercise drills um, and getting ready to put up a, uh, a whole arm care series. Um, so a lot of the things that I like about arm care are things I don't um, and incorporating more of the lower half of the body into things. Um, on press sports, I am lightning performance Twitter. I'm lightning perf KC because they don't allow as many characters as I want, but, uh, yeah. I think, uh, that pretty much names all of them. And then, uh, obviously the, uh, the phone number here to the office is 816-945-4048. Um, that's probably the most challenging way to get a hold of me because um, I'm pretty much seeing patients sun up to after sundown every day. So um, one of the socials or email is the best way for sure. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on, guys. Um, I'll put all those links down in the show notes. Um, if you guys have any questions, make sure you uh, send him an email or slide into his DMs. Thanks. Thanks.